I decided to talk today about the topics of gender equality and development because it's an essential, essentially important topic. The starkest manifestation of gender inequality is what Amartya Sen called the missing woman phenomenon. Something like 60 million to 100 million of women are missing in the sense that they should be alive and they are not. Today in the world, particularly in the developing world, but not only, women lag behind men in many domains. In education, particularly in access to secondary and tertiary education, in labor markets opportunities where they are less likely to hold a job, and if they do hold a job, they are less likely to, to earn, uh, they earn less money. And in their access to political power, uh, mainly to political representation. It's long been recognized that there is a two-way relationship between the empowerment of women, that is the closing of the gap between, this, between women and men in all of these dimensions, and economic development. On the one hand, economic development, if it favors women more than men, which is something we are going to look at, can bring about equality between men and women. In the other side of the relationship, a gender empowerment can favor development if, which again is something we are going to investigate, if women make decisions that are better for long-term growth. What I want to do today is to review the evidence on both sides, whether it is true that economic development leads to empowerment, whether it is true that empowerment leads to economic development, and then try to assess whether at the end of the day, when we take all of these things together, the possibility for this virtuous circle indeed exists. It, is, it doesn't appear that parents willfully discriminate against their, their girls relative to their daughters in everyday life. Even in countries like Pakistan or India, where we see very big differences in the number of boys relative to the number of girls, which indicate that in general parents have a preference for sons. So does that mean that girls are not discriminated against? No. But it means that when you see the discrimination appear, it's in time of crisis. South Africa has the same witch killing problem, and the witch killing epidemics went down after the introduction of old age pension, because when, you have an, when your witch happens to be also getting an old age pension, there are some reasons to try and keep her alive. If you go back to the, to the Elena Rose paper, the phenomenon that I spoke about, that in drought, women are much more girls are much more likely to die than boys, is only there for households that are landless. Another example of a related phenomenon is a paper by Kevin Munchi and Mark Rosenzweig, which look at the entry of India in the world economy and the impact that it had on girls in Bombay. With the introduction of, uh, of the opportunity to work in these call centers and things like that, it became valuable to speak English. And women and men were equally good at doing that, so they started sending their girls to school in English. They're boys too, but not that much because they wanted to keep one link with the, with the caste as a social network. So the diversification had helped the girls actually leapfrog uh, their brothers in this case. If you really didn't want to have a girl uh, in China or India some years ago, uh, you would have to uh, commit infanticide, which most people are probably quite uh, reluctant to do. But now it's not very difficult. You can get uh, sex-selective abortion. It's illegal in India. But uh, in the street of Delhi, on the divider of the road, you had these little ads uh, that you could see, which, which was said, better pay 500 rupees now than 50,000 later. And when that becomes easier, people do it. And you do continue to see sex-selective abortion in the US and in Canada today. So that's one example where in some sense, development goes the wrong way. Economic development goes the wrong way. Consider, for example, giving scholarships for girls, which is a very popular policy in a lot of developing world to encourage girls to go to school. So it's there in Bangladesh, for example. It's, these, these kind of policies are actually very expensive per extra girl you bring to school. So you could have done something that was gender blind, like having more teachers, for example, or treating children for their warmth or making sure they're healthy in other dimension, which would actually help men and women equally, so wouldn't bridge a gap. So what I want to do now is to 
see whether there is some reason to think that uh, there is indeed this relationship between the power of women, their education, their income, their access to political power, property rights, and things like that, and uh, education, health, uh, productivity in the house, etc. There is in fact a strong relationship between the share of income that is being owned by women, or that, is, that women have the property of, and the ways the budget are spent. So in particular, there's more investment in nutrition, more investment in education, more investment in health when women, are, uh, when women have, more, have a higher share of the income. And what I found in the data is that if you look at girls, young girls who live with a grandmother grow faster, they are taller, and they're also a little bit chubbier, uh, compared to those who live with either no grandparents or with a, a grandfather. So I have a paper with Chris Yudry from Côte d'Ivoire which shows that uh, so women and men grow different crops. In a year, which is good for women, more is being spent on food, more is being spent on women's clothing, more is being spent on jewelry. In a year that is bad for, wo for women, more is being spent on alcohol, uh, more is being spent on, 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 again, on men's clothing or, private or, or, or things that are private to men. So this implies that the family is not, not only it's not a fully harmonious unit, but it's not an efficient unit. And therefore we cannot count on the family to allocate resources efficiently once we get the resources in the family. We can see that the family is a very odd unit to make all these decisions because it's not clear they're, doing, they're making them very well. I was telling you that India has a quota system. So the way the quota system works is that one third of the, the equivalent of the mayor, if you want, the mayor of a group of villages, uh, one third of these mayors have to be women at any given point. And we found that women leaders invest more in drinking water, uh, and, but they invest less in schools in West Bengal and less in roads in Rajasthan. But as an economist, I have a little bit of a problem making an efficiency argument that water is much better than schools. So the conclusion is that there is indeed a complex relationship uh, between uh, uh, empowerment and uh, development but probably no free lunch. But take the example of Burkina Faso, which is in one clear example where improving women's property rights would seem to would create, it's just like there is money lying on the sidewalk. So we can take, and take that money. So suppose we do that. That will increase household income by six, yield actually by 6%. So suppose that yield is income. You now have, just by doing that, you have an increase in 6% of income, which is very nice. But would 6% of income be sufficient to convince their parents to educate their girls more than their boys now, or to con convince uh, husbands to give some more rights to their daughters? I don't think so. It's too small. That means that um, economic development alone is insufficient to improve significant progress in important dimension of women's empowerment, particularly decision-making ability in the face of persistent stereotype. So it shows that you force people to make decisions they don't want to make, and then it can indeed change the social equilibrium in a more persistent way. The bias disappears, and indeed they are much more likely to elect women down the road. However, it means that this will require policy action. This policy action might be self-sustaining, but it will be needed. So neither economic development nor empowerment is unfortunately the magic bullet that we'd love to find to solve the development problem or to solve the gender equality problem. To bring about equality between men and women, it will be necessary to take policy action that favor women at the expense of men, and probably it will be necessary to do it for a long time. The collateral benefits will be there. We've seen that they will be there, but they might not be sufficient to fully compensate men. So we may need to continue to have the political courage to stand for equity, for its own sake. Thank you very much.